pull them in, even even if your children are young and you just do snippets, that's okay. Just show them and say, this is real. Let's talk about a few more ways to just make history come alive and make it fun. What other points do you have? Well, as I mentioned on the previous podcast where we were talking about language arts, um, reading books is so important. And a lot of our reading in our school is history. Um, In fact, Mm -hmm. most everything we do in school is based on our core history topic. Like I said, we're currently about to go into Renaissance history. And so almost everything we do is going to be surrounding that. And that includes our literature. So I will either grab, I mean, I go ahead and start picking out books before we start the curriculum. And we use mystery of history, by the way. So we will pick out several, or I pick out (laughs) several historic, um, you know, fiction books, but also the kind that like an Usborne book or um, mm-hmm. DK book that has tons and tons of photographs. Yeah. Those are so fun. And and lots of illustrations of the insides of houses and, you know, how everybody did everything. Those are really valuable books. And I, we use both. We use the nonfiction and the fiction. And then if there is, um, sometimes you'll get a biography. Like if we're getting ready to study the Reformation, we will read straight from Martin Luther's writings. And so that's not fiction. It's not an Usborne book, but it's ooh, it's a primary source and that's the best thing for history. And so I wanna mention, that's how we pull our literature into our history. But I wanna mention the importance of primary sources because for those that are not familiar with that term, that's history that was written down at the time that it happened. So, Mm. um, you know, when our founding fathers wrote their diaries, when we have their speeches, those are primary sources. Um, The Magna Carta is a primary Mm -hmm. source, but also any documents written by people that were alive at that time, you know, at the the time of the Magna Carta, that's a primary source. We have lots of different chronicles written throughout history. So anytime you can pull that in, definitely do it. no matter what age your children are, because it's important for them to see this is a this document is a thousand years old and this is how we know it happened. And if you only have little kids, but you want to show them, you know, maybe a, a chronicle like the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, that that tells a lot of really interesting history, little tiny snippets, you know, it talks about all of the English, um, the Englishmen before they were considered English. Um, you don't have to read the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle to your five-year-old, but if you have a copy, and you can get all this stuff on Amazon, by the way, if you have a copy, you can read them a couple of lines and say, this was written by people over a thousand years ago. That's mm. how we know what happened. They wrote it yeah. down. Um, you know, when the Vikings attacked England, they were writing it down and they described what happened. That's where we get the information from. Pull them in, even, even if your children are young and you just do snippets that's okay. Just show them and say, this is real. This is not something that someone made up later. Um, In fact, I'll do a little plug for my um, Knowledge Keepers bookstore. That's what I specialize in. I have found old books that went out of print and brought them back into print because they are primary sources. So every one of them, I have um, 13, 14 different titles right now. And they were all that kind written by people who were there they saw the history or they wrote a diary and it's been published i haven't changed anything i just thought wow this is too good to go yeah, you know to go into awesome. the the dustbin of history so they're just brought back in paperback form oh that's so cool and that's on your website i'm assuming yes you can get there from nikki um but that okay. website is knowledgekeepersbookstore.com Okay. I didn't um, know and, you even had that. That's great. Oh, yes. That's that's my whole other side business and hobby. Okay. Um, so also, I highly recommend making stuff. And I know that's kind of a general category there, but some families kind of tend to shy away from crafts. But I, I would like to recommend that you try. You know, um, we did Sumerian clay tablets one day, and all oh, I did fun. was buy the the modeling clay from Walmart that's air dry and some uh, little wooden, I don't even remember what they're called. They're not dowel rods. They're very thin, but they were able, the kids are able to basically make a Sumerian alphabet on the clay, let it dry, done. It was a simple craft. It was not messy, Um, but they, 
after we learned about the Sumerians and, and, you know, their contribution to the written word and history, that was a fun way to solidify it, get their hands busy. They kind of worked on it while I was reading aloud. So that was kind of a, you know, keep your hands busy while you're listening to me. Getting hands on is so fun. And um, yeah. I would say if, if you don't like messes or crafts, just set aside a day, cover your table with something protective and just do it anyway, because the kids will not forget, um, you know, paint the picture, whatever it is. There's so many different possibilities throughout world history that you can yeah. that you can get hands on. It can be small. It can be huge. Um, when I was a kid, we you know, I'm from Texas. We've been Texans for nine generations. Uh, we did a paper mache Alamo. It was big. Oh, <laughs> and fine. lots of people were involved. I will never forget that. Yeah. Um, so that's the kind of thing you can do a group project or just a little family craft, whatever, but yeah. get, get involved with that. And I'm saying do it once a month or twice a year. It doesn't have to yeah. be every day. Yeah. Um, and one of my most important pieces of advice when teaching history to your children is to do it chronologically, mm. because, uh, if you went to public school, you might very well have learned it all over the timeline without understanding how people and places were connected. And so I always like to start history at the beginning, at Genesis 1, watch the progression of world history and biblical history because they went together and see how it all happened and played out and see, you'll just see so many different ways that one thing builds on the one before it. You know, one group of people, whatever they did, wherever they came from, it's the result of the people, the generation before them or multiple generations yeah. before them. Um, you see that in the Old and New Testaments. You see it all throughout world history. And you cannot study American history without understanding world history before it. We are such a small blip on the radar of history right. here in America. But we tend to think, oh, American history is all there is. And yeah. it's not. There's, there's so much of what we have that it's only because of what happened in England and Germany and other places in the world. And without those events, our history might be very different. So whatever history curriculum you use, try to try to start at the beginning of world history and do it all um, chronologically. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned uh, that you use the mystery of history and we love the mystery of history. We've used that too. And I love that specifically because she, well, it's, it's very well written. Uh, it's written mm -hmm. by Linda Hobar. She's mm -hmm. got all four volumes, but it is written from a biblical worldview. And it is. so that is such an important part of teaching any history curriculum. I think that we tend to think, well, mm -hmm. if you just pull any history, it'll be fine. Um, we've also used not grass history, which we've really mm -hmm. enjoyed. Um, and I know there's tons of great, um, you know, history, uh, BJU press has great history, um, resources, and all of those are from a strong, solid biblical worldview. And so, you know, as people yes. are looking I'm for- I'm glad you brought that up too, history. because some people say um, Christian history, a Christian history curriculum is very biased. And I think some of them can be, but honestly, uh, if you try to be unbiased, generally they leave out all of biblical history. Right. And that's biased yeah. also. So you right. want something <laughs> that recognizes all of world history, the good and the bad, all the ugly yep. stuff too, but- shows you God's hand in history and shows you who all was yeah. Christians. So many of yeah. the people that we study all throughout history, most people don't know that they were Christians, famous scientists mm -hmm. and explorers. Right. And so that's very important to know too. Homeschool Insights is sponsored by CTC Math. If you're looking for a great online math program, visit ctcmath.com and try it for free. For more great homeschool inspiration and resources, listen to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. 